The new podcast, In the Shadow of Princeton, starts as the matriarch of a prominent Princeton family is found stabbed to death in her locked basement. Investigators look from a serial attacker to her family to Princeton University students. One hot-blooded investigator sees a conspiracy. Is he way off base, or does privilege let you get away with murder? In the Shadow of Princeton is available wherever you get podcasts, or you can binge it ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ducks Confidential Podcast. As always, I'm James Kreppia, joined by Ryan Clark. And we'll take a look back this week at a truly dominant performance by Oregon against Illinois and what was a, a top 25 matchup, a top 20 matchup. Uh, this past weekend and uh, a runaway uh, for the first half and then what really was uh, kind of a cruise control situation in the second half and take a little bit of an early look at this week's trip to Ann Arbor and the big house and what will be of what on paper is certainly a bigger matchup than uh, not just this past weekend but a bigger matchup because it's the reigning champs even though they are clearly uh, a, a shell of the team that was uh, a year ago, but nevertheless, it is it is Michigan. Uh, it is the reigning national champions. It is going to the biggest venue in the sport, uh, and it is one of those longer trips uh, for Oregon this season. But, but for, we'll first take a look back to this past week, and as I mentioned, uh, truly, if not for uh, the one drive, if not for the 95-yard touchdown drive uh, that was – significantly enhanced uh, and, and prolonged by uh, a self-inflicted error on the uh, penalty on Derek Harmon and then three third down conversions thereafter. If not for that, this was very close to, I don't want to say perfect performance, but awfully close uh, because if not for that one drive, all the other yards that Illinois gained in the second half obviously ended up being totally empty calorie uh, hollow yards because they ultimately failed to convert on subsequent fourth down. So who, who cares how far down the field they got when they were down by so many points? They didn't end up doing anything with it. Uh, the two long plays on the day, a 44-yard catch that, while a nice play by Zakari Franklin, uh, he did appear to get away with a push-off on Jabbar Muhammad. Uh, and the 34-yard run, initially it was flagged and then they picked up the flag and said it was legal where it looked like uh, i believe it was franklin again got away with a block on the back of uh, kobe savage that helped kind of spring the run for the distance that it went for if not for that illinois didn't have a play over 20 yards <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they uh they being the ducks just a completely dominant performance uh and probably their best performance of the season quite honestly just given the the nature of the game against what what is undoubtedly i think a quality opponent a team that as we talked about on the last podcast could end up winning 10 games this season you know that's those guys are no slouches by any stretch and and so for oregon to have come this far uh through eight games to to go from disappointing and raising so many questions against idaho in the opener to to now going out and dominating um a, a team in the upper middle sort of tier of the big 10 um it, it shows how far they've come and, and frankly you know it shows that the the ducks are the best team in the country right now and the way that they're playing on both sides of the ball is the reason for that and i, I think that this could potentially be the best defense that oregon has had in the last two decades if, if you look at the, the performances and the talent and the depth and and the ability of this team to go out and punch a team in the mouth like illinois which um you know ha has some players on offense and for oregon to have the performance it did defensively to be up 35 to 3 at the half um Thanks in large part to, to obviously the play of its offense and Dylan Gabriel slinging the ball around the, uh, the around the field and looking every bit the Heisman contender and, and perhaps the, the Heisman leader. I mean, the odds are shifting and, you know, make make what the of what the odds that you want. But, you know, Dylan Gabriel right now 
uh, back among or the betting favorite to, to win the Heisman. And, and frankly, when you're the quarterback of the number one team in the country and you're as efficient as he's been, um, I, I think he deserves to be in that conversation. But the Ducks, you know, big picture are, have have used that Ohio State win as a springboard to to rattle off um, a, a pair of performances that have just been terrific and, and have just showcased how Dan Lanning has built out this roster to, to truly contend for a national championship. And, um, you know, in, in a college football landscape right now that has teams uh, perhaps underperforming their ranking or having some questionable games, including Ohio state, obviously having a bit of a, a slug fest against Nebraska, which was unexpected. It's looking like Oregon and Georgia right now are, are the two best teams in college football uh, and, and are, you know, separating themselves from the pack as, as the season goes along four games to go for the ducks. Um, and, and one of them obviously being this big one on, on the road at the big house. But, you know, I, I would imagine that, you know, the way that they've played lately, it should, it should be a, it should be an interesting one for, for Oregon on Saturday. And we'll talk more about the Michigan game, but you know, this Illinois game really a display, I think of Oregon's, you know, balance, on both sides of the ball, it's ability, it's talent, and and frankly, you know the way that they're playing right now is they're they're the best team in the country right now. Yeah, this was this was dominant, uh, especially in the first half. But this was dominant again. If 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 not for the one drive defensively, uh, the the yards allowed and everything else about how Illinois was moving the football, basically they really weren't. Uh, and then offensively speaking, yes, thirty five points in the first half and. The starting offense uh, on the couple of possessions it punted, it wasn't because of Illinois making incredible plays. It was really just they didn't they didn't execute or they didn't quite get the number of yards. I mean, on the one possession in the first half that they punted, they go on wildcat on uh, third and three, and they pick up two yards. And just because of exactly where they were on the field, you choose to punt rather than necessarily go for it. But quite frankly, had they gone for it, I have very little doubt that they would have gotten it. Uh, Illinois was not stopping anything. I mean, the one TFL was the sack, which came on a very long developing play that uh, uh, unfortunately you don't get a great replay of it in the game uh, in the uh, broadcast film. Uh, so it's kind of hard to tell exactly what the, what the picture was looking like down the field. But uh, Oregon had had a, a decent game before it and then was in a formation of a uh, four by one and it looked like uh, that at least one of the receivers, that there was actually confusion on the defense, and it looked like one of the receivers may have actually been largely uncovered pre-snap, but at the same time, if the play's not drawn up to go to what appeared to be the very, very, very far left outside receiver, which I believe might have actually been the running back, uh, then it's kind of hard to, to necessarily ad-lib and, and shoot for that. But be that all as it may, uh, Yes, a dominant performance across the board. Really, in every way, uh, hard to kind of nitpick away at anything uh, uh, that was not good because, the, quite frankly, especially in the first half, there really just wasn't anything. Yeah, um, and folks have raised like questions about, oh, you know, the last five third quarters, it's only been this amount of points, and I believe it's three points in those last five third quarters. But you have to have to take into account that two, the most recent two of those five have been in games where the the first half has largely been dominant, especially the the Illinois game. Um, and frankly, if you're Will Stein and you're Oregon. Uh, you're going to dial it back and you're not going to, you know, you know, come out in the second half guns blazing and, and try to, to show everything and put more on tape than you need to against a team in Purdue that you definitely feel good about the second half and, and a team in Illinois that you've done so well in the first half that, that you, you've set yourself up to do the same thing. So I, I don't. I think that there might be a little bit more being made about that than um, there should be, but you're also in a position now uh if you're covering this team if you're watching this team where you're sort of searching for those sort of things i i sure i i guess i i i say i i i don't think of all the things to take away from 38 to 9 uh the lack of scoring in the third quarter if i had a, a hierarchy of things 
for me personally, that that would just not be one of them. <laughs> it just it just wouldn't. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> you had two possessions in the third quarter, and as I say, the first one ended in a punt where they drove fifty five yards, and uh, and then on back to back plays. Uh, to end the possession, uh, had incompletions to Justice Lowe. One was on a throw over the middle that had to be behind him because if he let him, uh, Justice may not have a head, uh, let alone uh, that it was probably going to be intercepted. Then on the subsequent throw, which I think would have been short of the yard to gain anyway, uh, I think Lowe dropped the ball, or it certainly went off his hands. So that's the first possession of the second half of the offense. And then the second one was uh, the interception that kind of a, a mistake from Gabriel. It was the only mistake that I could really see in terms of Gabriel's decision-making from throwing perspective uh, in, in so far as that it was double coverage. But it turned into double coverage based on what appeared to be a pretty nice play by the defender. So kind of tip your cap the other way of like, all right, yeah, it was avoidable, but it was also a nice defense that is permitted. Yeah, yeah, they had they did a good job. And also it was the, the game state that sort of, for a guy like Gabriel who who likes to take shots when possible that this is the sort of situation where it's it's much there's much more leeway for you to do it when you're dominating a game the way that they were and it's also like for their offense it's the law of averages like they had an incredible first half 35 points is just phenomenal against an Illinois defense that yes they they struggled against Purdue but in general this season has been a really solid unit and and they play in the Big 10 and have those type of athletes so like the third quarter being what it is, I mean, that that to me, like if if one or two of the touchdowns that happened in the second quarter carried over into the third, then you wouldn't even be having this conversation. It's just it's just the law of averages in a lot of ways. So, uh, yeah, I, I say I, I just don't have a lot to take away from from those couple of possessions in particular. And especially, look, you can't have it every which way you can't talk about air yards and want to see the, the football travel a whole big old distance. And then when you're up by, you know, 35 to nine and, uh, and you take one of those shots and it just doesn't go your way. Now you're upset that you didn't, I mean, it's not going to work that way every time. You know, to me, the takeaway of the game is you're up 35 to three and it wasn't even that close. Uh, the takeaway of the game is a quarterback who had a 15 to one touchdown interception ratio. I throw two interceptions, one that was just an absolutely atrocious throw. Yeah, that was um, a punt. <laughs> I, just absolutely <laughs> awful, uh, awful in every way imaginable. Awful, even if he didn't think Tysheem Johnson was going to end up dropping as he did. It was still awful. Um, that, I mean, there was that, that was absolutely atrocious. Uh, and the second one was uh, a nice play by uh, Sione late there. But ultimately, the... You know, he completes less than fifty percent of his passes, Altmaier, and in terms of targets and where they're at. Again, if you take away the forty-four yarder, because that one, again, nice play by Franklin, but uh, certainly appeared to get away with a push off there at the end. But okay, hey, that's part of the game too. But if you take away that, uh, I mean, his otherwise sixteen of thirty-four for less than one hundred and twenty yards. I mean, what are we talking about here? Yeah, and on um, top of it, the the fumble that wasn't, but should yeah, should have that, been. Yeah, that's it. Um, that that would have added to the turnovers, and then all the turnovers on downs too. I mean, just like you y you can look at the yards, and and I think they are a bit of a misnomer, as you sort of noted, a lot of empty calories um, there in terms of the second half and those couple of drives that that you know ballooned that number higher than it was i mean it this was this was pure dominance from the oregon defense it starts with Derek harman getting into the backfield the way he does did the guys on the edges are playing phenomenally well i think that you know mateo uyangalale has had a great season but you know with the absence of jordan birch there was a, a question to see who would step up and, and tatum to these last couple of games has has really done that for the ducks um so there and on top of that look the secondary um a, a lot of new faces and and you know how do they fit together and everything else secondary has has been i think an underrated aspect of this defense's dominance these last several weeks obviously jabbar muhammad leading the way but a guy like nico reed you know having a, a 
quote unquote podium game and and we get a chance to chat with him after after that uh, went over Illinois and um, the performance he had and the performance that the secondaries ha- had in general the last couple of weeks has, has really been impressive yeah Nico had by far his best game uh, not just of the season of his of his two seasons uh, at Oregon and I would have to go back to uh, his play at Colorado where it was a career high in terms of pass breakups with three uh, which of course means you have to be targeted as well but combination of it all of, of the PBUs yeah he has a couple of tackles one of which was a tackle for loss on a run play which was just a really good read by him combined with uh hey you know he, he blew through a, a block where I mean for for a team that's known for its physicality I mean the no one I can't remember if it's a tight end or receiver but ultimately the <laughs> the guy was supposed to block him uh Came up empty on that one. Uh, so, <laughs> again, a really, really, really spectacular game all around for Nico Reed, uh, who is, look, he's been a guy who at times his fan base has really gotten after because, uh, look, when opposing offenses are avoiding throwing at the top cornerback on this team, uh, they got to throw at somebody. And last year, it was largely either Dante or Triquez Bridges or nico when he would get in the game and nico has ascended to being at the cornerback two spot and at times he's been picked on at times and frankly it's not i don't think he's played extreme i don't think there were games where he was extremely poor or anything this season i thought he had several good games already but this was one where when you combine the caliber of the receiver with the I'll just say efficiency of the quarterback because Luke Altmaier is, he's fine. You know, he's, he's, you're not going to confuse him with being in the top three in the league or as an all conference caliber quarterback right now. He's not, but as a decision maker, 15 to one was 15 to one entering the game. You know, he hadn't made critical errors and while they hadn't had huge, huge numbers to Pat Bryant or Zachary Franklin entering the game, those are capable receivers. And I say the the minimal production that they had, they combined for 98 yards. And like I say, nearly half of that came on the one catch, which was against Jabbar. And again, it's part of the game, but Franklin got away with something on that one. Otherwise, neither of them, they did not complete a pass in Nico's direction. The one, that, another one that could have, would have, should have, Bryant made, or I believe it was Bryant, uh, m- nearly made, nearly made a spectacular uh, tip drill catch to himself. But of course, it ends up getting dropped and, and overturned on review. And that was good coverage. It just it was very nearly a spectacular catch, but it wasn't. So, okay, yeah. well, bottom line, like nothing really got completed in his direction. He played particularly well. And on the other side of the field, anytime that they went at Jabbar, with the exception of the one play, they didn't complete anything at him either. Yeah, and I think it's a continuation, too, for Nico of of answering the bell against Ohio State. You talk about talented receivers. That's an even more talented receiving core, and he, he was he was answering the bell in that game along with Jabbar. So, you know, it's both of them, and, and obviously the safeties have played well, too, um, but, but those two corners in particular, they, they – like the idea of being two small corners that uh, that overcome the the sort of height difference as well. That was something that Nico Reed touched on a little bit after the game. That him and Jabbar joke about that being the shorter corners, but um, both of their performances, regardless of that, have just been phenomenal the last few games. And, and that's kind of the couple of areas that look first off defensively. Uh, like you've mentioned, Ryan, look this this past defense is absolutely unequivocally better. Uh, than it was a year ago. And it's more talented than it was a year ago, and it's backing it up statistically compared to a year ago. And right now, they're, they're 16th in terms of passing yards per game uh, compared to where they were last year by the end of the season, which, of course, there were two games against Washington in there. where We need not you know, go back to those, but they were 54th in terms of yards allowed per, you know, passing yards allowed per game last season. They're 16th right now. It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. In terms of efficiency rating, they're in the top 10. That's massive. 
yeah, now they were in the top 15 in efficiency last year. That's, that's why some of those yards also was okay. You know, in, in terms of efficiency, they were really good. But, of course, the Washington games really skewed it. Here, obviously, the Ohio State game is going to skew it to a certain point. The, the, the only real areas where uh, I'd say in terms of, look, they, they're going to be favored as a team in the, each of the next four games. This going to so quote unquote supposed to go undefeated, uh, depending on what exactly happens with uh, Penn State and Indiana, particularly each against Ohio State here down the stretch. Uh, they may or may not need to win out in order to assure themselves a spot in the Big Ten championship. But be that all as it may, is Oregon the best team in the league right now? Yes. Are they probably the best team in the country right now? Yeah. Are they playing like it? Absolutely. When they get to the points that are going to decide championships and playoff positioning and playoff wins. The only areas that nevertheless are there like that are against the better teams are going to be either exploitable or there are question marks, you know, where they're not question marks are Purdue and Illinois and UCLA and uh, when uh, coming up here, uh, Maryland, probably Washington, heck, probably Wisconsin. Uh, these are not areas that those teams are going to exploit. But Ohio State, perhaps a second time. Maybe, maybe not Penn State and or Indiana, again, depending on who prevails over the next month. And then who knows in the playoff in terms of what those potential matchups could be. We'll get into that. We've got a whole month ahead to, to look ahead to that kind of thing. Uh, look, for as good as the pass defense is, you still are talking about going up where an, an opponent who has multiple major weapons and an NFL quarterback, that's a different situation. It's a different situation compared to who Oregon has played so far with the exception of Ohio State, where, yes, they had the receivers. Yeah, they have some good running backs. And now, now, even Ohio State has some major concerns because of how absolutely decimated their offensive line is getting. And their run game has not been good at all, in, part, in large part due to the O-line. But, you know, ultimately, you still have two of the, what you thought were two of the best backs in the country, and they're not playing like it. So they've got some of their own problems and questions. Well, Oregon's got some vulnerabilities, either in exactly how they match up with the elite of the elite, as well as they're playing, or, you know, not for nothing, Jordan Burge is hurt right now. And when you're trying to win in the playoffs and win either three or four games against the likes of Ohio State, Penn State, and or Indiana, if they get in and through, not that I don't think that would be a first-round matchup necessarily or a quarterfinal matchup, but eventually, possibly, or the likes of the powers of the SEC, whether it's Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, Ole Miss, LSU, Texas A&M. You got two undefeated teams in the Big 12, a couple of undefeated teams out of the ACC still. You know, you're not worried about plastering a couple of the worst teams in the country in UCLA and Purdue or a overachieving, but let's call it what it is, not extremely talented Illinois team. You're talking about taking on the other top 10 teams in the country. You know, is this defense playing a whole lot better than it did in week two against Asengenti? Absolutely. Has it played a running back anywhere near his caliber outside of the pair at Ohio State? No. Not, not even in the same stratosphere. So could there be vulnerabilities against a team who might have a really good running back? Maybe not the best running back in the country, but could there be vulnerabilities there? I, I think you can't totally look past that. Could there be vulnerabilities against certain passing attacks who may have a combination of quarterback talent, scheme, and receiving talent? There may be some, some vulnerability there. Are they showing it against these opponents? No, no, they're they're absolutely blowing the doors off these opponents. Uh, and frankly, I'm not sure Michigan is one of those teams who's going to put a whole lot of charge in them. May, maybe, maybe 
on Michigan's defense, where because that that is a talented unit, even if offensively they are struggling to do a whole heck of a lot. But other than that, uh, I don't see a whole lot of areas that in these next four games that Oregon's going to be challenged, really. But yes, do I think that the Michigan defense is going to pose a challenge this week? Yeah. You know, they have a top 15 run defense, not allowing a whole heck of a lot of yards. And they've still got, in terms of just talent, in terms of who is in, who's going to be heading to the NFL next season, uh, they've still got some talent on this defense. Now it's it's been vulnerable against the pass, and that's where <laughs> that's where for whatever difficulties there may be on the ground, Oregon may still be able to uh, blow the top off here. That may may depending on Will Johnson plays, uh, but ultimately there's. For as good as they're playing, and they deserve to be number one, and they are clearly the class of the Big Ten right now, are there still potential vulnerabilities in this team? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to call it what it is. You know, this is not a, a this is not a juggernaut that is just absolutely impenetrable or unstoppable. Or there could still be a couple of things. You, you're allowed to admit that there may or may not be a couple of flaws or vulnerabilities that a team who has extreme strengths in those areas would be able to take advantage of. Yeah. And I, and I agree. And I think that that is the case for the entirety of college football this season, as crazy as it is. So, so that it's a double edged sword, right? Because it's, it's an advantage for Oregon in that, you know, that, that field quote unquote being as wide open as it's been in recent memory gives them a, a, I think better chance in some ways to, to go and win a national championship. But on the other side of it you yourself obviously possess those vulnerabilities and the parity that exists in college football is such that you yourself could be you know uh, the victim of of an upset in the in the playoff as a result of of some of those vulnerabilities or you know different health concerns down the road or any number of factors that could that could factor into to what happens in in a playoff game so yeah i mean oregon is is one of the most talented teams in the country they're one of the most experienced um they're playing the best of anybody i think right now and and will you know be odds on favorites to to finish the season undefeated given the the lack of strength in the, in the remainder of their schedule um overall but yeah, I mean, you know, you could get to that Big Ten championship game and um, get a rematch with Ohio State, and, and they they take a bite back out of out of you, and and you lose, and and you take a step back, or you you even win that game, but you get get into the playoff, and um, you face a tough matchup against like a let's say Tennessee is surging at the end of the season, or or one one of these top tier teams from the SEC, or or even some of your compatriots from the Big Ten. Um, and you face a tough matchup and yeah, I mean, you know, it's going to be a, a slug fest. The, the big thing for Oregon, which, which I think is the hallmark of a lot of great programs in the country in general, but, um, it is one that they preach and one that they appear to be living right now is, is the sort of obsession with the process and this sort of week to week level of collective focus that I think is evident, you know, teams can talk about it. Teams can, you know, say, Oh, these are our programs values. This is what we believe in. Yada, yada. And sometimes that can be lip service. I don't think it's lip service for this Oregon team. I think that they have bought into Dan Lanning's sort of obsession with the process and they are focused on the long term. Well, simultaneously, taking it as the cliche goes, quote unquote, week by week. And I I think your exchange with Dylan Gabriel was, was a pretty stark example of that. Obviously he's had an incredible career. It's meaningful for him to have passed Timmy Chang in in the, you know, passing yards list all time in NCAA history, but he is so locked in on the, the idea of, as he said, quote, chasing wins that's an attitude that I, I think is shared by everybody in this locker room. And if they can maintain that, if they can keep the focus, if they can, you know, be as obsessive with the process as they have been, then that could be the edge. That could be the difference in a year with so much parody. Yeah. And no, I will say that, uh, uh, Dylan, for one, he said that, uh, 
uh, to everybody who was asking. He said that to CBS on the field as, as well. Uh, look, uh, for one, that's that's what really good quarterbacks say. Uh, so hardly uh, um, revolutionary. Too, it's just it was true before the season. You know, he was going to be approaching some of these records just by default in terms of just comp- compiling yards, compiling touchdowns, perhaps career starts. Again, as long as he stayed healthy, these things were going to be holding true. Uh, that it's also true that these are not these don't have to be mutually exclusive. It could be about chasing wins and winning a national championship. And oh yeah, by the way, if he manages to get to New York and or win the Heisman and uh, end up being the NCAA record holder in career passing yards, touchdowns, and the like, I, I don't think he'll I don't think he'll give those away. Now, give, if you want to say give those up and prefer to win a championship, sure. But again, these are not mutually exclusive things. But be that all as it may, uh, he's playing really well. He deserves the uh, the accolades and attention that he's getting uh, along the way, along with several other players. We mentioned Nico this past game, thought Justice Lowe played probably his best game. Uh, Kenyon Sadiq is obviously just playing really, really well right now. And, and of course, in the absence of, of Terrence Ferguson the past couple of weeks, but playing really well right now. Uh, I mean, aside from just production, uh, again, when you look at some of these other plays in terms of blocking down the field for Sadiq, for low for at times Evan Stewart. I mean, he only has the one catch this past game, but he had a couple of really nice blocks in this past game. Um, those, are the, those are the plays. Those are the things, again, that, that don't show up in a box score, but you go back and take a look at, uh, in particular on the offense, that really stand out. Uh, but in terms of looking ahead to not just this Michigan game, but in the picture holistically, I think part of it is the expansion of the playoff where we're going to be focusing on more teams uh, and and who could end up being in a much larger field uh, this season. And another part being the byproduct that there is just greater parity. I, I agree that Oregon and Georgia probably separated themselves to a point. Uh, I would still keep Ohio State awfully close to that. I wouldn't put them miles behind. Penn State, you have to put up there for the moment again. Well, that, that'll get sorted out between Penn State and Ohio State as to exactly um, thereafter. Yes, Miami's undefeated, although because at times they've made that rather chaotic, I, I would think they kind of deserve to be where, the, where they're at behind those teams. Uh, and Texas, if not for you know really being taken to the woodshed by Georgia, uh, yes, is not miles behind either. If there is a particularly significant cut and gap, it's probably after that. And I'm not sure how significant it is when you've got a really good Tennessee team who, yes, did lose to Arkansas, but a really good Tennessee team, an Notre Dame team whose win early in the season uh, against A&M is, is looking better by the week. Undefeated BYU and Iowa State, at times, neither of them have necessarily looked dominant, but they are nevertheless undefeated. Uh, the aforementioned A&M, who's the first place team in the SEC, yet they're third in terms of the poll rankings of the SEC teams. A Clemson team who everybody kind of dismissed and forgot after Georgia just beat them up. But, oh, yeah, by the way, they're still hanging around. And then you're getting to an undefeated Indiana who hasn't even trailed this season in their 13th in the polls. And a two-loss Alabama and Boise State. I mean, there are other years where when you start getting into after outside the top 15, there would be other seasons where you'd, you'd stop even paying attention You've got an undefeated Pittsburgh team down there. An undefeated Army team in there. A Pittsburgh team who is playing SMU coming up here. A two-loss Ole Miss who's also got some talent. And if they manage to put it together, I I hate to tell you, you don't want to be be the team in the 6-11 matchup if Ole Miss ends up being the eleven. So there are still some very live bullets down there in terms of who could end up making this playoff field to where there is quite a bit of parity. Yeah, and it's more crazy. than there has been. Yeah, way more than there has has been in recent years. And I, I think it's crazy that um, I, I think it timed out with the the advent of the transfer portal and, and a lot of different things that, that have happened across college football. But it's it's crazy that this level of parity is uh, is existing in the first year of the 12 team playoff. It it 
I'm, I'm sure the TV executives are excited about it, certainly. <laughs> and as a neutral, uh, as a neutral watching college football, I'm sure it's uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. But man, it's it's nuts that there's this level of parity with with the opportunity for these upsets and and miraculous sort of playoff runs for for these teams that you were just talking about. Like it's it's going to be fun in December and January. It really seems. Yeah, not for nothing. There was a pretty good amount of parity last season. I know that in the end you had a national championship game with a couple undefeateds, uh, but ultimately, you know, Florida State also got left out of the playoff. Georgia got left out of the playoff. Uh, a one-loss Ohio State team gets left out, obviously. Oregon, who only lost to Washington. Missouri who had a fine year and ended up beating up on Ohio State in the bowl game that, you know, they're, yes, there were opt-outs. And there were 10-2 and two teams with Penn State, Ole Miss, and Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma may not be, you know, they basically they might have been the weakest of the whole group. Like, there was, there was parity last year. Not saying that Michigan wasn't far and away the best team. They were the best team. They were the best team and they were the most talented team. They may or may not have exploited a few things to get to where they got to, but, you know, whatever. They're not giving it back. Still got the crystal ball. So, yeah, the top two, certainly, maybe three, if you want to throw in Texas for sure. Bama, obviously, the game went you know, the, as deep as it did in terms of the semifinals. Like I say, there were teams who, I would say the next four teams who missed the cut last year of the four-team field in a eight- or 12-team field all would have been very live in such a situation. And at the next tier... May have been as well. So had it applied last year, would have been awfully interesting. And this year, it could be extraordinarily so, depending on exactly who wins conference championships, the first round buys and matchups and how things get drawn up by the time we get there. But it is shaping up to be a very, very exciting November, uh, not just for Oregon and Oregon's purposes uh, and elsewhere in the Big Ten where you're getting another top five matchup with Penn State and Ohio State. That's really significant. And oh yeah, by the way, again, this Indiana team who continues to get validation on a weekly basis. Now, again, they're not they're not going to be fully validated until the Ohio State game, that's for sure. Now, until they get a win over a team who's that good, there will be questions. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be. But, and, and frankly, similarly for Miami, because Miami, there's a chance that they could go undefeated without having played a ranked team in the regular season until an ACC championship game. So I'm not saying that there's, you know, there, there are teams out there who either have really, really good records, whether it be one loss or, or undefeated, who don't have either some questions or vulnerabilities or what have you. But no, it just speaks to, yes, that there's a lot of parity in this sport. When Alabama is at six and two and coming off a, a, absolute waxing of what was a ranked team in its own right. Yeah. There's some parody in the sport. Um, there's, there's, there's some greater balance here. Uh, so it should shape up to be a, a fun November, uh, for the sport as a whole and to, and shaping up for what could be, uh, really a, a December, unlike anything we've ever seen before because of the expanded playoff, because of, uh, on campus games, uh, the weekend of the 20th, 21st, uh, in particular, I mean, we're really we're, we're less than two months away from on-campus playoff games, uh, which again we've we've never seen uh, in the FBS level. So, will certainly be a whole lot of fun uh, looking ahead to those things. Outside of certain things with the Michigan matchup, uh, where again it's probably a little early to get into exact exact by way of individual players, the like. Again, it goes without saying that Michigan's offense is. Uh, on the struggle bus right now. Um, but okay. Looks like Davis Warren's going to be the guy from a quarterback perspective. Um, and again, they're, they're, I'll say this about their running game. It may not be exactly as it was drawn up to be, but Mullings is playing pretty well. Donovan Edwards, who's getting all the attention in the off season has not been their number one back. And, because their passing game is struggling so much, you're not going to focus on receivers, but Colson Loveland is probably the best tight end 
at least in the league. And he very well might be the best tight end in the country. I understand the Penn State tight end is also very, very, very good. But Loveland's really good. Then defensively, again, they've they've got talent now. And they've got they've got real talent. Uh Josiah Stewart, Mason Graham in particular, those are those are some really, really talented front seven players. And Stewart's got eleven tackles for loss. Graham's got five and a half. Th- those are future NFL players. Stewart in particular is extremely good. But they're also dealing with some injuries on that side of the ball. So we'll, we'll see. We'll get there. We'll, we'll see how it shapes up. But outside of certain individual players and matchups for Michigan, not sure what else to get into ahead of this one aside from, oh, yeah, by the way, they are playing uh, in the biggest venue in college football. <laughs> and uh, no matter how meandering uh, Michigan may be at the moment, can't, can't act like that that place is uh, – it's not a library. Uh, it's it's awfully big. It's awfully loud. And yes, Oregon is the better team. But you can't say that, oh, it, it ain't no big deal. They'll go on the road and, and there won't be any challenge by way of environment. Uh, it will be the biggest and loudest environment that they play in this whole season. Yeah, and, and there could even be a little bit of an extra edge there by way of Michigan obviously being the defending national champions and being one of the the blue bloods of the Big Ten, you've got you got these new you know troublemakers in Oregon coming to town and they've they've been number one in the country. They've been dominating. They beat Ohio State. All this stuff and it, it, I'm sure there is motivation on the part of Michigan fans and frankly Michigan players to to sort sort of shut that noise down a little bit and and to to get a win and, and prove yourself against a team that that you're expected to lose to you're the defending national champions and your two touchdown dogs at home. Like they, they have that motivation. Um, you know, in terms of the game, I, I think that the, the two most important things to look out for would be one, Ken Oregon's offensive line, which I think over the last few weeks has been among the best, if not the best offensive line unit in the country. Can it continue to protect Dylan Gabriel, give him a lot of time back there to to carve up a, a Michigan defense that, you know, frankly, has been pretty poor to say the least against the pass. Uh, can, can he continue to find those weapons that he has uh, on his, on his, uh, at his disposal rather uh, at the wide receiver position. And then secondarily, you know, with as quote unquote one dimensional as Michigan has been, can the Oregon defense maintain the, its caliber of play? Like we saw against Illinois, uh, because if they do, I mean, this is, this is, in terms of just the multiplicity and the, and the the variance that you're going to see on offense, this should be an easier task for the Oregon defense. I say should. There have been games this year where you know good running teams have broken off big games against them. Yeah, the Genty game is an outlier because Genty is Genty, but at the same time, um, you don't want a regression at a time like this, especially given the environment, especially given, you know, the quality uh, of, of opponent that you're facing. So those, those are the two biggest things for me, but yeah, I mean, the environment's going to be probably pretty crazy. It's, it's, it always is at Michigan. Um, but, but for the number one team to be coming into town, uh, I'm sure that Wolverine fans are relishing the opportunity to, to try and pull the upset. Now look, this would make their season. Any win that they get the rest of the way uh, against the three better teams, I'm, I'm forget about Northwestern, uh, that will make their season. Yeah, they beat their in-state rival this past week too, and that's yeah, th- that's always something. Yeah, sure, but you know, there's no guarantee that Michigan's going to be any better than a six and sixteen. And that's the other thing to mention going into this one because just like basketball beating Michigan at home through a sellout crowd or near sellout crowd last season for Oregon. And it was a, a, a fun game and a good game and, and entertaining. Uh, Michigan wasn't good. And they moved on from Juwan Howard. So it can be looked back as because of the brand that it generates a certain kind of attention. Well, not for nothing. Michigan may be the reigning champs. They're a shell themselves. They may still have some talent at certain positions, but ultimately, no, they're not very good. 
And without beating Michigan State this past week in what was a competitive game, they may have been in jeopardy of not even getting to 6-6. Six and six. Because, again, they've still got to play not just Oregon this week. They've got Indiana, and they've got Ohio State down the stretch. So in terms of betting odds and the like, they are probably going to be expected to go 1-3 and three in the next four games, which would leave them at 6-6. Six and six. So aside from the brand and what they achieved a year ago with a team that is nowhere near that team, and yes, the venue, not much to make of potentially an outcome in this one, even if Oregon were to dominate, quite frankly. Because by the time you get to a Big Ten championship and or the playoffs, looking back and saying you dominated a 6-6 six and six team is not exactly going to be something you want to be bragging about. Like, yeah, you might have. <laughs> like, and what else you got? Um, like I say, this is not a Michigan team that, forget about it compared to a year ago. No, even compared to the prior couple of years. They're, they're not at that level. They're just not. They're starting at the quarterback position, but you know, and then that's a big, big part of it. But this is not a Michigan team anywhere near at the same uh, caliber as it has been the past couple of years. But that's all aside. Elsewhere, in terms of looking a little bit holistically as we enter November in the uh, Big Ten as a whole, because we, we chat about it at times briefly uh, in the past, particularly at the beginning of the season, uh, mentioned before that Indiana is obviously still having a, a terrific start and staying undefeated uh, and putting itself in position where, yes, it does still have Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, I don't think the matchup with the, – the, the finale with Purdue could – that could lead to a whole lot of broken records, uh, I'll say. Um, otherwise, this, this week for Indiana going to Michigan State and only being favored by a touchdown, uh, and I know Michigan State's, uh, frankly – you know, they, I thought they played okay this past week, uh, albeit in a loss. And again, I don't think they're a team that's necessarily going to beat themselves a whole heck of a lot. But I'm surprised that Indiana is only favored by a touchdown in that game. And yes, obviously the Penn State-Ohio State game is enormous. Uh, shaping up to be at the top of the Big Ten, the Penn State-Ohio State game is... you could You could argue really that both coaches entering that one this week for their respective fan bases, you could argue that it's nearly a must win for both of them because especially with how absolutely mediocre Ohio state looked against Nebraska. If Ohio state were to lose to Penn state for the first time in a long time and suddenly have two losses in league play, and no longer be in absolute control of even reaching a Big Ten championship game, let alone worrying about its seeding in the playoffs. With a, a matchup in Michigan at the end, no matter how mediocre Michigan may be at the end, uh, if you don't think that there would be calls for Ryan Day to be out in Columbus with a loss to Penn State, I, I can assure you uh, <laughs> there would be. And conversely, for Penn State's purposes, not to say that one loss would suddenly destroy their season, but of all the seasons, if you're Penn State and James Franklin, of all the years, you're quote-unquote finally supposed to break through. You know, your offense is playing better, a lot better, compared to at times what had been a really mediocre group the prior couple of years. Of all the years that you're quote-unquote supposed to break through, and here is, for as talented as Ohio State is, and oh boy, are they. If you're Penn State, you're, you've just been waiting and waiting and waiting year after year to finally break through and finally get it. You're home. Yeah, Ohio State may be favored in the game, but you're the home team. And you're the offense that's playing well. If you're not going to get them this year, when is it going to happen? So this is a chance where, again, maybe not what must win in terms of, I don't think people would suddenly be calling for James Franklin necessarily speaking, again, especially since they still still be very well positioned for playoff purposes. But in terms of like, yo, know, you got to finally break through here. You have to actually, you know, the divisions are gone. Like I say, like of all the years, like this, this is kind of the year to try to break through that if you're Penn State. 
who doesn't have to play Indiana, who doesn't have to play Oregon in the regular season. And then again, we mentioned Indiana before. They're having a nice run. We'll see how they end up finishing up in a couple of their bigger games. Outside the top four, the top four have clearly separated themselves. I I think the middle eight of the Big Ten on any given week, nearly the full eight, maybe, maybe the middle six or so, six or seven. I think about any given week, if you matched up any of them against any of them, you could probably get a result that wouldn't stun you. From Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, maybe Wisconsin, Nebraska, perhaps Michigan State, Washington, USC. I, I, I'm a little hesitant to throw Minnesota in there necessarily, maybe in the, exactly the right matchup. But that whole cluster, if you shook them up and, and anybody played anybody, I, I'm not sure you'd be totally blown away by no matter what the result is. And then at the bottom, all right, the bottom is clearly the bottom. I mean, I mean, <laughs> by a mile, <laughs> P- Purdue, UCLA, Northwestern. Uh, and at this point, uh, Rutgers is starting to, uh, to put itself, uh, in that class along with Maryland uh, as well, quite frankly. Um, they're, they're both maybe four and four overall, but, uh, you know, their, their lows are awfully low. Uh, the bottom four or five, bottom three, especially are really distant. So the top four have separated themselves. The bottom three have put a, a, rather wide chasm uh, between themselves and, and the rest as well. But again, everyone knows in the middle, like I can say, I, I think you could shake up just about any of those. And and, and frankly, this weekend is going to have a couple of those kinds of matchups where I, I, I'm not sure you're going to be, you would not be mystified if in the Wisconsin-Iowa game, I'm not sure anybody would be stunned about an outcome one way or the other. Kind no, of a thing. no, definitely there's, not. There's, there's just the a lot of too. parody in the middle of the league where I mean, look, <laughs> here's of all things. I think North, Northwestern is now favored. I think Purdue may have opened favored in that game, oh, which wow. was stunning, which was stunning. <laughs> so, I saw somebody mention like, oh, Purdue opened as a home favorite against Northwestern. I go, how? How, how, how is that possible? Uh, but no, elsewhere in the middle, like I say, like I, <laughs> Indiana, Michigan State, a, a, a touchdown spread. UCLA, Nebraska, a one-score game. In terms of point spreads, and I think Nebraska is considerably better than, than UCLA. But because the point is, is that there's there's a level of parity. USC Washington, for for the old Pac-12 realm, SC by two and a half at Washington on a 4:30 Pacific time game that's going to be on Big Ten Network. You know what would have happened in the Pac-12 era if yeah, all right, even if they're two middling teams, if USC Washington were on Pac-12 Network. It, you know what would happen? I mean, think think about that for a minute. It's on Big Ten Network, and really now that the uh, uh, Xfinity deal is is all figured out, no one's raising hell about it. But you can imagine, can you imagine a world in which USC and Washington, even as two four and four teams, would have played, and and that game weren't on, were, were on the conference network that weren't on a ABC, ESPN, yeah, sign of the Fox, times, FS1 yeah. kind of deal. Here, oh, okay, well, they're both four and four, and it's, uh, oh, well, yeah, just throw it, throw it onto the list. And that's, it's a little bit of a reflection of, yes, sign of the times, the way the season's going for each of them, and also a sign of uh, you join the bigger league, and, uh, hey, you got, got a few other few other brands, you know, you're going to be vying for television attention from. You know, it's just not, uh, it ain't wrapped up here. You know, you can't take that one for granted just because you are, not November, at least. If that game were back in September, before, you know, each of them took some lumps. Yeah, it might have been a little bit higher, quite frankly. Uh, but at four and four apiece. Not now. <laughs> no, very much not. So very much w- not. one thing that, that we talked about and that um, is really interesting to me is in terms of the Big Ten and, and the teams that have separated themselves and everything Um Let's say that the the wheels come off for Ohio State. They lose to Penn State, and they also lose to Indiana. Both both of which <laughs> both of which right. on their schedule. Um, that would that would make it more likely <laughs> in that scenario that uh, that we get to a, a three twelve and zero team scenario, which is something that's starting to get talked about. Obviously, a lot of things have to happen for this to happen. But you know, Oregon, Penn State, Indiana all finish undefeated. Your question might be. 
who the heck goes to to Indianapolis for the Big Ten championship game? Um, and there are tiebreakers in terms of yeah. uh, uh, collective win percentage of conference exactly, opponents. Exactly, exactly. Oregon and so is ahead. Oregon, at the Oregon is ahead right now in that and should finish ahead given the the quality of its schedule. But it, it might even out a little bit. Either way, um, you know, you look at that. The first tiebreaker is head to head can't be used second tiebreaker is common conference opponents they're all undefeated it doesn't matter third tiebreaker is the record against conference opponents in order of those opponents record the common ones uh that also can't be used they're all undefeated so yeah the, the fourth tiebreaker is more than likely what is going to come into play in that albeit you know unlikely let's say scenario just given the quality of the schedule for both penn state and indiana the rest of the way um yeah, based on on the conference opponent record through through these eight weeks, it would be Oregon and Penn State in the game, just because Indiana's schedule has been weaker. Now, Indiana's schedule is going to improve by way of quality in in conference record, but will it improve enough to catch those two teams down the stretch? If that happens, who knows? So we'll we'll see how that shakes out, but. Right now, it's that fourth tiebreaker of, you know, the the conference opponents' cumulative winning percentage, which is bound to change every single week. So, as someone who roots for chaos and very much relishes in it, uh, I, I appreciate people looking ahead to such scenarios. Uh, however, um, this is college football; crazy things do happen, upsets do happen. Uh, in some cases, these wouldn't even necessarily be dramatic upsets. And when you see that Indiana, in particular, has. Uh, a matchup with Ohio. Well, Ohio State has two of these matchups with uh, a Penn State and Indiana in the month of November. Uh, I, I'd say to let a few things play out before extrapolating just yet, because we were only a week removed from some people ready to coronate uh, Army Navy as a multi time matchup, the ultimate wrench in the playoff scenario. Uh, and what do you do when they play back to back weeks and then the one game doesn't matter? And oh, yeah, by the way, uh, that's just not going to happen. So. Uh, I'd say to let a few things play out before we get to that just yet, but be that as it may, there are tiebreakers in place in the extraordinarily unlikely scenario that such a thing were to happen. And uh, again, Oregon's in the driver's seat for it regardless, but be that all as it may. Many games to go, much to be seen, but shaping up for what will be, uh, again, an all-time uh, kind of November here for Oregon's purposes. And really, again, I, I reiterate, for the sport as a whole, uh, because, boy, the way the way... The way that the races are setting up elsewhere, uh, either at you know where where a couple of teams are pulling away in the Big Twelve and the ACC, or where the amount of parity and competitiveness in the SEC exists, uh, there's going to be a lot of teams vying all the way to the finish line in terms of trying to make statements and get in this twelve team field. That especially as the at large is yes, it's a twelve team field, but you're trying to be one of the top six top seven from an at-large perspective uh goodness there are going to there are going to be some very upset people at the end i'll say that they're definitely going to be <laughs> so a couple of people are going to be getting their feelings hurt in that one uh before you even get into conference championship game losers who could be one loss teams and quibbling about whether or not they they deserve to be outright eliminated from the playoff over a two loss sec or big 10 team and if you it, look, if Iowa State and BYU in particular, if they both make it through to the Big 12 championship game undefeated, if you don't think, regardless of how that game plays out, if you don't think that there will be a two loss Big 10 or SEC team and their commissioners and their coaches lobbying all week long that they deserve to be in over whoever loses the Big 12 championship, you're crazy. So again, it's going yeah, to be a it, fun it, November and December, but there's going to be some very upset people at the end. There are, and and that's the nature of college football in that's general. Gonna be the fun, yeah. it, it's it's the fun. It's 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 a huge part of of the entire experience, and it and it ain't going anywhere. If anything, it's more amplified by the fact that this is an expanded playoff rather than you know who gets in with the, with the top four. If anything, there's more people getting more upset about about getting in this field. So it's yeah, it's, good. It's, it's yeah, good. Exactly. It's it's fun. It's, it's it's what makes uh, what makes this such an exciting sport to cover. And some of those uh, upset fans, uh, because even at uh, eight and zero, there can uh, never be pure uh, joy and bliss and happiness. Surely there will be aggrieved parties uh, each and every week, which is also part of uh, college football. They are free to uh, contact Ryan 
uh, and send in questions to his mailbag and uh, a <laughs> reminder uh, for the folks who uh, wish to uh, hurl grenades accordingly. Ryan, uh, how should they uh, go about doing that? Yeah, you, you can hurl grenades. You can also say nice things and have have normal questions as well, if you'd like. Um, I know that that the Internet is not often a place wherein you, you find positivity or nuanced discussion. But what you're welcome to send it my way as well, in addition to, to whatever gripes or, or uh, uh, critical questions you have uh, either on Twitter at Ryan T. Clark or uh, via email at rclark at oregonian.com. Mailbags posting every Tuesday, getting some a good number of questions this week, but always want more to, to add to the mix. So uh, feel free to send me those questions there. And uh, again, a reminder to like, subscribe, five star review of the podcast. So that way uh, it helps grow the audience, helps other people see it, and it makes things a whole lot easier for you because it just populates automatically accordingly both for ducks confidential and for all of our other fine uh podcasts here at the oregonian uh and with that uh, we will bid you adieu for this week and uh we will see you next week for a recap of the uh, trip to ann arbor that is for oregon and also believe it or not uh we will also spend some time next week looking ahead to the basketball season because oh yeah by the way uh yeah that's very much rapidly approaching and basically upon us. Uh, we are just over a week away from the start uh, of the basketball season for both the men's and women's programs, obviously. So we will take a look ahead to that as well next week. So we'll have a busy week ahead and a busy podcast next week. But uh, for this week, uh, we will bid you adieu and see you next week. 